Are we capable of change? Can we really make this world a better place? We are inundated with news of crisis all around us. Global unrest, war, pollution, melting ice caps. Many of these are directly related to one thing, oil. Something that once seemed so incredible has become a thorn in our sides. Not only that, but once you burn it, it's gone forever. But what can we do about it? Where can we go next? When we work to use our natural resources wisely, recycle more, plant more trees, and travel smarter, we leave our world a better place. Aptera is here to help by delivering the world's most efficient electric vehicle with a 1,000 mile range and solar charging of over 40 miles per day. Building a smarter future starts with more. Imagine never having to fuel your vehicle. With Aptera, you can go about your day while your vehicle charges itself up for free. It gets all the power it needs from the sun without ever having to plug in. We call it Never Charge, an integrated solar package providing over 40 free driving miles per day, making the Aptera the first vehicle that won't need to fuel up for most daily driving. It also gets a record-breaking 1,000 miles of range from its battery pack, taking you further than any other electric vehicle. How is this possible? Well, because of our advanced aerodynamics, lightweight parts, and an efficient electric drivetrain, we use less than 100 watt-hours per mile. This means our small solar package can still take you a long, long way. Never charges built into every Aptera, and it can produce enough free solar power to travel over 11,000 miles per year. At Aptera, we're building the world's most efficient transportation. Aptera is for anybody that's looking for a unique solution to their impact on the planet today. If you can lower how much energy it takes you to go the distance you need to go, and if you can use it in a vehicle that's focused on efficiency, that's made with less materials. You're just doing good for the planet and good for your pocketbook and good for everyone else. The user interface really helps people navigate all the controls of the vehicle and it has to be something that's easy to use and something that's intuitive and something that has all the robust features that you would expect in a modern electric vehicle. That effort alone is, is quite challenging and we needed some type of quick way to deploy that in their timeline. So Crank was the solution when it came to the embedded graphical user interface design and implementation of the software. Crank has really helped us streamline the development process by enabling us with tools like Storyboard, which consolidates all the information from the user interface, makes it really easy to change and modify, and really helps speed up the development cycle significantly. It's a multi-platform software solution that it was very agnostic to the hardware that you chose to implement the graphics. On top of that, they have the tool sets that made it very easy to not only design them in, but actually implement it for functionality. What we've created with Crank is something that's really intuitive for the driver, but gives us a lot of extra benefits to show the efficiency of the Aptera. Uh, things like, how do you add range to your trip? 
things like how efficient are you really traveling and navigation tools. It would be really hard to implement with anyone else's software solution. Everything you create in the prototype form in Storyboard, you can take to production with you. So the investment that you put into the design, the development, the execution can carry into production. And I think that crossover from the designer to bringing it to functionality was seamless. From a company standpoint, they're just the support that they provided went above and beyond. The people at Crank have been great. They've supported us infinitely, and we've been able to make really great progress on our user interfaces really quickly, far faster than I'd imagine with any other software development company. Crank really stood out from the crowd in terms of software development platforms for user interfaces because their solution really enables our engineering to progress a lot quicker and for things to be modified and changed on a much more rapid pace than with anything else out there. Based on the outcome of this project, Crank and Aptera turned out to be the right fit. And I think moving forward, it's gonna continue on that path as they get into production and delivering that feature-rich experience that the customers are gonna want when they first get in their Aptera. They say the best things come in small packages. But with Aptera, we like to think that the best option for an efficient electric vehicle comes in a package that's just the right size. We designed Aptera to be the optimized shape and dimensions for peak aerodynamics and low drag efficiency. But what dimensions are those exactly? Let's talk numbers. Each Aptera is 172 inches long, 88 inches wide, and 57 inches high. Now, let's put that into context. An Aptera is about the same size as other leading energy-efficient vehicles, yet Aptera's state-of-the-art battery and integrated solar panels can take it four times further than comparable electric vehicles with a similar battery size. Though Aptera has a completely unique design, it's perfectly sized for highway, back road, and city driving. Now let's talk about cargo space. Most comparatively sized vehicles have about 13 to 18 cubic feet of cargo space. Aptera has 25. That's enough space for an entire family set of luggage, around 40 bags of groceries, or, to put it in very 2020 terms, 500 rolls of toilet paper. It's also definitely enough space for your pet or some camping gear, both of which inspired add-on features available for the Design Your Own Aptera. We'll go more into those in another video, but for now, you have an exact idea of the way Aptera will fit into your life. Ready? Good morning, and uh, welcome to the first of a series of tech demos that we'll be hosting at Aptera, focusing on uh, different areas of the vehicle and production process. I'm Steve Fambro, and this is my co-founder and co-CEO, Chris Anthony. Happy birthday, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll be here at our new production design studio. During the uh, Q&A, we'll get a little closer to the vehicle. Uh, we're excited to have our, our good friends from Elafe, Goraj Lampic, and CEO, and Goraj Gotovac as CTO. Thank you guys for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, good job with the names. <laughs> um, we'll, uh, we'll be covering uh, a lot today, and uh, including what makes the LaFe motors so unique, how they're tested, what Aptera customers can expect in terms of performance. So we look forward to doing that with you. Um, both, both of you gentlemen, Goraj and Goraj, I would like to talk about the USA trip that you did some time ago. Uh, Alafe's philosophy and, uh, and the collaboration that we're doing now. Um, I thought we'd start by going back maybe 10 years or so when we first met. It was a very different time. Um, what inspired you to come to the U.S. and what did you hope to accomplish while you were here? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Steve. So uh, I, actually, I have just returned from Detroit. Uh, I was there last week and it's an uh, interesting place. Uh, but yeah, 10 years back, um, it was different. So, you know, we just, um, we did several years of research and innovation, and then we thought, okay, let's make business. And then we were thinking, okay, how to make business with innovation, with something that's uh, not yet out there. And then we, you know, we were 
uh, we saw the entrepreneurship uh, activities and see that you know Silicon Valley is the place to go to. Uh, so we visited several uh, investors, uh, some incubator incubators like Plug and Play. Um, luckily, we visited also you in uh, your Vista facility at that time, and it was an interesting experience, I would say. So um, we were uh, hoping to get an A round investment at that time, but later we learned that we were not that mature and we were more ready for like a seed round. So um, uh, there was uh, not such a success at that time, but we learned several things about our business model and improved it. And uh, we learned what triple F means, like friends, fools, family. So this is how we funded then the additional research when we got back to Europe. That's a, that's a, a great yeah. info on how you got started because uh, I can appreciate where you were in the friends and family round and then to how much you've grown when I visited you back in October of 2019. Uh, that must have, that's been a, a massive growth uh, since then. So it's great to hear that. Um, tell me, what's, what's the philosophy of Elafe Zinwheel motor design and also the power electronics? Okay, I'll handle the, let's say, uh, commercial aspect and, and Goras will do the technical. So, you know, we want to enable the vehicle manufacturers such as you uh, to deliver something that's really good for the user, for the mission, and that the vehicles will be, you know, in line with the digital, digital technologies and no longer with, uh, you know, traditional car parts that are becoming a commodity. And, well, we believe that with in-wheel concept, uh, there are some benefits like, you know, you have more space, you have better efficiency, you can play with the design, maybe time to market can be, can be accelerated. And we simply want to enable this kind of vehicles. Yeah, I completely agree. So this is, you know, this is where we come from, but then the solution, it has to actually support this. So if we want to support companies like Aptera that, you know, want to build something which is, you know, more as Gura said, mission driven user driven rather than just driven by the supply chain uh, so if we want to do that then we we have to provide a platform a platform which is you know very flexible in terms of uh, allowing some possibilities like um, uh, let's say new functions new um, uh, new benefits to the user as well as uh, you know really cover the basics or improve the basics you know safety efficiency and these kind of things uh, and we really see the, the in-wheel motor architecture. We shouldn't really focus just on the motor. It's about the architecture. We see it sort of as blank uh, freedom, you know, so design freedom, you know, uh, control freedom, innovation freedom. So you can, you can basically, by using this platform, uh, you can do much more that, than we can even imagine because you know your users and you understand what they want. So technically, we are focusing to provide lightweight, efficient components. Uh, so that you have, you know, really a lot of freedom plus uh, very precise control of these components so that you can build on top of that with your uh, software ideas and, and software uh, functions. I, I haven't made that connection uh, to the freedom aspect yet. But that's quite interesting because uh, we've learned from our research of our customers that they, they really resonate with the idea of the freedom of being able to go 600 miles, 1,000 miles to park and charge in the sun and uh, it's also interesting that the freedom of design of your product helps us deliver freedom to the customer. So that's a great synergy there. Chris. And it's just amazing that um, we met a decade ago uh, and you guys have progressed this motor technology uh, so mightily. And now we're uh, back with Aptera and it was a perfect fit a decade ago, uh, but I don't think you guys are ready. And now I think, um, you know, it's, it's prime time. Um, you know, having seen uh, videos of, of how your motors work uh, from your website and Steve's uh, time um, with you in Slovenia. Um, it's amazing the durability that these in-wheel motors are capable of. Um, what do you guys do to assure that durability through ice and mud and snow and rain, you know, all the conditions that uh, our Aptera drivers will see um, and put these motors through for uh, hopefully decades uh, of use? Yeah, so, so I thought about this, you know, this is always the main question. Uh, so I said, just talking about this, you know, it doesn't do it justice. You really have to see something. So I, I prepared just a few pictures that I can also share with all of your viewer, viewers uh, today. 
so hopefully you can already see. So, uh, you know, when somebody buys a vehicle, they, they imagine, you know, you know, all of this uh, vehicle testing going on before, but it starts way, way before, you know, just, just the components itself, all of the testing that's required for that. And this is just a few of the tests. Uh, and, and you can see it's about, you know, climate, it's about temperatures, about humidity, uh, it's about, you know, water, uh, uh, dipping it in uh, extremely cold water, uh, running it in water, basically. It's about all sorts of loads, you know, using robots to, to, to load the motor to see what happens to it. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's very fun to, to develop. Uh, and we really hope that it's also going to come through uh, to the final product in terms of how fun it is to drive. And we do testing, you know, questions about what happens to the brake? Does it heat up? You know, to get to have an, a, an answer to that, it's not enough. You know, just to have an engineering hunch. You you have to test. You have to see actually uh, how your simulations um, compare to to what what actually is seen in real real life. So, what we do is we we do a lot of testing, but we have an amazing testing team. I really have to say. Uh, that this is one of our, our most uh, um, one of our strongest teams in the in in the company. They don't just do the testing. They built a lot of custom custom benches. These benches just did not exist before because nobody tested something like this. People did test wheels, so we said, okay, why not use a wheel testing bench, but just modify it to do what we want to do to measure the air gap, to to measure the loads, to see the durability and the changes that that happen through the lifetime. Uh, and people, of course, they build temperature chambers, but they don't build it, you know, to test in-wheel motors with such high torque. So we had to modify it. We had to build around that technology that exists to basically do the testing that we wanted to do. And of course, leverage as much as possible also existing technology because you don't want to be, you know, uh, innovating where everybody else is already very, very mature. So you see some testing here. I just wanted to test, you know, uh, it's quite harsh. Uh, you want to test for the fringe scenarios because uh, once you get to the fringe and you overcome the fringe, then you're sure that the car, you know, in normal driving, it's going to be extremely reliable with very low chance of, of something happening. And once, once you're really, really confident and you're done with the component testing, uh, not really done, but once you are far enough, you're never really done once uh, well, when you do development, uh, then you go to vehicle testing and, and apart from all of the testing that we do, I, I really you know, cherish uh, all of the time spent in winter testing. It's something amazing. I think every engineer that, that does that, I think it, it holds a special place. And, and we do it now for, uh, what is it, Goras? Is it four or five seasons now? Uh, every year, except, except for this year, because of COVID, it's, it's been really limited. Uh, but we did a lot of testing and, and it's you know, different surfaces, different, uh, different uh, inputs to the powertrain. And you really get to know all of your failure modes, what can happen. And that helps you develop, you know, iron out all of those things. Uh, and that just connects, you know, vehicle testing on the high vehicle level, uh, you know, buildup of snow, these kind of things. You just see, okay, it builds up. What happens next? What, what, what could happen? Do I have to test something on my bench? And then you go back to your bench and you do some more testing. And it's very important, you know, really observe, really have uh, standards exist, but they, they just don't uh, cover everything uh, that we do. And of course, when the, the, the machine is ready and when the, when the system is stable, then, then comes the, the fun part. And I, I wanted to show some things and, and to people that are listening, just uh, go visit our YouTube channel. We have a lot of videos uploaded. And then you can do things like drifting and you can, you know, you can do three months of winter testing. It's as fun as it can be. You, you know, you don't even pick up a wrench to repair something. That's when you know, okay, now I have a reliable system. Uh, and then you can start playing with things like this. And, and um, I'm not sure what Chris and Steve have in mind for you know, <laughs> their demos, uh, but I'm just putting out there, um, uh, we are not as smart as you are in terms of what your customers want. So just go and innovate on top of uh, what you provide. Uh, and, and there are many things which I could show, you know, uh, testing of, of different surfaces, uh, just gathering input, transferring it to then durability benches and just proving, yeah, this works. And it doesn't just work, you know, for a demo drive. It has to work 
you know, for extended uh, duration of time. And th this is this is basically what we are we set out to do, uh, because we do want this not just just as a nice toy, but really as something that people use. Nice. Yeah, That's the uh, Aptera use case is probably a lot less stringent than uh, many of the vehicles you test with, right? So, um, you know, one thing um, you know, we do a lot of here, and I know that you guys do too, is, is testing these motors, you know, uh, beyond their capability, testing to failure. But what does testing to failure mean to you guys? And, uh, you know, how do you incorporate that into making the Alafi motor the, the best solution? Yeah, yeah. So these engineering tests, they are... They're very important to learn, you know, what are the weak points. They might, might not fail, you know, within the, the designated time, but they can fail outside of the designated lifetime and they still tell you a story. They tell you, okay, what could be within this, you know, scenario, what could be my, my first concern? And then, then you go and you evaluate whether you want to, you know, honestly spend engineering money and spend also possibly component money to solve that problem. Uh, and, and when you have, you know, uh, when you're inventing basically the standards in some respect for this kind of technology, many times uh, you really invent first the test, which is, you know, way overboard, overboard, and then you dial it down when you talk to the customer and you understand the need. So it's really important in the process. We um, see people uh, in the comments to Aptera uh, talk about the Nwell motors and how different uh, the ride will be, but maybe you could talk about your experiences uh, with how the motors perform in traditional automotive applications and how, uh, how you deal with, you know, the unsprung mass that, uh, that, that people often talk about, you know, what, um, um, what have you guys seen in the field? Well, yeah. we did a lot of analysis in uh, unsprung weight and this kind of, um, this kind of uh, potential drawbacks. So currently those uh, OEMs who are you know, experienced enough no longer see this as the main issue. Uh, those who have tested the vehicles especially. Uh, so there are some benefits of having a low center of gravity, but the main criteria in our case was, you know, try to keep the motors as light as possible because this obviously has multiple benefits on the cost uh, and at the end also on the unsprung weight. So the experience with the vehicles that we have is that uh, once you tune the suspension in a proper way, even with a passive uh, suspension, all these, um, all these unsprung weight issues could be easily resolved. Uh, so several tests were done on different terrains with different suspension um, developers and manufacturers, but it's also vehicle specific. So for each individual vehicle, you need the requirements and then tune the suspension accordingly. Uh, the in-wheel motor itself doesn't bring such a huge additional unsprung mass to the corner so that it's uh, pretty manageable. So we are really interested, uh, you know, there are engineers are right now at your workshop, you know, overcoming all of this traveling, uh, traveling uh, issues with COVID. Uh, so, you know, all the feedback that we can get from them, uh, we always get, you know, so to understand how does your vehicle handle, is there anything we can do still? So uh, we are really looking forward to, you know, increasing all the testing that we'll do together with you. Yes, Jan arrives, I think, this evening. Yeah. And uh, we look forward to having him working with us Friday and this weekend. Yeah, I think the, um, you know, the, the benefits far outweigh any negatives of uh, putting the motors in the wheels. You know, when Steve and I uh, first started talking about this, you know, over a year ago uh, now, it's just uh, to not have any pumped lubrication uh, through a transaxle or a gearbox to get your propulsion is just a, a whole nother world in terms of, you know, how you get the vehicle down the road. And then if you can put the, uh, the motor in the wheel, uh, it frees up packaging space all over the vehicle for batteries, for other electronic components, for HVAC, you, you name it. Now we have the space for it. So I think, you know, the, the, the technology that you guys are bringing us is an enabler to our aerodynamics, to our packaging, to our center of gravity efforts, to all that. So um, I think it's a, it's a great combination of both what we're trying to do internally at Aptera and what you guys are trying to accomplish with your motor technology. I think gram for gram, it's very close to conventional setup because, you know, the motor replaces the bearings, the spindle, the brakes, the upright component. So all of that stuff is in the motor and you would have that weight anyway. Uh, so 
I think, uh, the, and the overall benefits, I think, are, are much, much better. Yeah, this is extremely important what you have mentioned. So, you know, because in big, a lot of big traditional OEMs, they have, you know, different departments. So one deals with the powertrain, one deals with the chassis, one with the body, one with electronics. But actually, if you want to use all these benefits enabled by new architecture, you have to look at this in a holistic way. And then on the vehicle level, you can obviously optimize. Very good. Well, we promised you guys an interactive technical discussion today. And so we'll be uh, taking some live questions from our viewers. We are going to, I think, go to video while we move locations out by the vehicle. So we'll rejoin you in a few minutes. Okay. You guys can you hear us? Yep. Um, so, uh, one of the questions is, which motor size is Aptera using? Small or S or M size? Small or medium size? And we're at, <laughs> okay. So, uh, we're uh, using one of your smaller pack, the smaller motors, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, Aptera is using the medium size, but it's, mod it's modified for Aptera specific needs. So, uh, it's very, uh, it's custom and it's very tailored to, to, to the specifics of the vehicle. Okay, great, thank you. Um, now how does a motor how does a motor optimize efficiency through the driving through driving the dynamic needs for power and regen? Well, it's uh, I would say it's a relatively complicated process. We have proprietary software that we have developed for uh, optimization. Uh, and it's a combination of two things. So one thing is having, an, let's say, uh, an underlying technology, which is e energy efficient. So we have an active part, what we call the electromagnetic part of the motor, which is both efficient in, uh, in terms of um, uh, converting uh, electrical energy to, to, the, uh, to mechanical, as well as very efficient in taking out the heat so it doesn't heat up. Uh, and then the second step is, of course, optimizing for the specific application. And when you're talking about, uh, let's say, requirements are like yours, that's that's one of the key parts. Very good. Um, in the spirit of the Citroen du Chevaux, uh, how easy is a motor to work on or to replace components? Your motor specifically. To... I don't imagine there's much really serviceable on it uh, other than the brake pads. 
Uh, yeah, so there is a special design. So from the motor perspective, you can uh, detach the rotor, you know, without uh, without uh, huge problems, and then you can do the servicing on the brake pads. Uh, so this is from the integration perspective. Uh, so this is from the maintenance. Then, uh, if it, the question relates to the development of the vehicle and how to replace the the complete system. Then I would say, of course, you can do conversion with such systems, but then you are not using all the benefits offered by the English motor. So it's much better if the vehicle design, you know, is started bottom up with uh, these benefits, uh, being, uh, keeping mind on that and uh, using them. Next question. Um, could you elaborate on why Aptera chose the specific point of power, 50 kilowatts? What are the trade offs? What would be better? Yeah, I mean, we were really just looking for a power equation per wheel that uh, got us brisk acceleration and got us into the greatest efficiency band that we thought we could be at for highway speed uh, travel. Um, you know, it's great that Alafe already had a package that was very close to our needs. So we just right. worked with them through the details on what that motor package would look like. And after we did that, then we said, OK, how do we make that motor package even more efficient for production? And that's the efforts that we're going through now is, is making that great 50 kilowatt uh, power per wheel motor the most efficient it can be for our production needs. Yeah, a, uh, F over M equals acceleration. And so we wanted the same F, if you will, of some of the modern uh, vehicles that are quite brisk. And that worked out to the amount of force that could be generated with 150 kilowatts. So, I'll tell you, testing around the parking lot, um, it's, uh, it's fast. <laughs> like. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. Our three-wheel drive package that we have uh, on the Aptera Noir behind me, it's, uh, it's fast. I have a very fast electric vehicle myself that I drive on a da daily basis, and the Aptera is significantly faster um, to yeah. the point that you have to warn people if you're taking them out because it's uh, quite shocking. Yeah, we can't wait yeah. for Jan to drive it. Yeah, I think it will be, you know, both the acceleration in a lateral direction, but also angular acceleration, I expect it will be terrific because I still remember the test drives from 10 years back, you know, with the first Aptera, it was like a go-kart, you know, I would never expect that it can go that fast in curves. And uh, I think now, you know, with even more torque, and I think this will be really superior from this uh, maneuverability perspective. So uh, looking forward to testing. Um, what's the operating uh, temperature range of the motor? Yeah, so we design and test to minus 40 degrees Celsius. Sorry, guys, uh, I don't know the conversion to Fahrenheit. Uh, and plus 65 is the external temperature. And of course, the motor internals get higher, but that, that's the external that, that we test to. And this is coming directly out of automotive standards uh, because, uh, you know, to some extent, the requirements in automotive are in terms of you know the temperature range even more difficult than aerospace you know, because uh, you have uh, you have to design for all sorts of different scenarios and and we were just discussing uh, with a colleague and he said uh, he, he's quite experienced he he used to work in one of the the uh, premium EV makers uh, and he said um, uh, yeah um, if you built a car with uh, aerospace grade materials. Uh, you're not going to last too long because show me one runway uh, which uh, uh, which allows salt being put on it. So uh, I sh I'm sure that you appreciate that. Uh, I think one of you is a pilot, right? So I I'm sure you appreciate that. Uh, uh, that's a, that's uh, yeah. a really good point. Yeah, yeah, making a reliable car is uh, much different than making an airplane. Even if you have to climb around some fancy new jets and look inside, uh, it's nothing like a modern vehicle. It's like you know, from a different world. Uh, one of the questions is, are the motor, I'll answer this one, are the motors uh, only air-cooled or are they fluids? They are liquid-cooled. You design a liquid-cooled motor. And uh, without giving anything away, we've got some really cool uh, intellectual property that uh, we can share with you soon, uh, share with you, Alafe, on how we uh, will cool these motors, especially the front motors, uh, while minimizing the fluid. So we're looking forward to sharing that with you. See, we're, we're already providing freedom for innovation. So, <laughs> yeah, um, awesome. uh, question is, I'm curious about weight distribution and handling. So we have about equal weight on each wheel. Yep. About uh, we're, uh, this uh, Aptera Noir is 65% uh, front weight body.
biased. We hope to be a little better than that for production, but that's uh, that's primo weight distribution. Keeps uh, keeps exactly the same traction patch on each wheel, so exactly the same uh, force metrics on each corner. And this particular one is about 600 pounds per wheel? Yep. Yep. About 600 pounds, which is what, 200-something uh, kilos? I don't know. Okay. But the weight distribution um, is is great with the in-well motors because you're also pushing the weight of the motor and transaxle in a typical EV out to the wheels. Um, so, you know, lowers the center of gravity, uh, does some great things. We're, we're just getting to the point where we're starting to, you know, do track testing and durability and stuff like that. So we'll get those kind of driving feel metrics. Um, but, you know, our intuition says that uh, every bit that we can lower the center of gravity and every bit that we can put a little more weight out on the corners is, is a good thing for us uh, being some lightweight vehicles. Next question is, uh, Tesla claims 90% plus efficiency in their motors. Are in-wheel motors 100% efficient? And of course, the answer is no, nothing is 100%. But can you guys talk about the efficiency of, of your system, maybe compared to other manufacturers? Yeah, so, so one thing that, that has to be said first is, again, coming back to the holistic approach. Uh, you know, uh, efficiency is just a number. It doesn't mean really anything. It doesn't. It's it's not. Uh, it's not. A, it doesn't have a direct meaning uh, to how far you can drive. It is correlated, of course. But you have to take into account the whole vehicle. You have to understand what about what is the aerodynamics, what is the weight of the vehicle, uh, what are uh, what is the, the rolling uh, uh, coefficient. And once you get all that all of that into account, you get the vehicle. Uh, consumption demand and then efficiency basically is stacked on top of that. So whatever losses the, the motors generate is on top of that. So the first goal is always to optimize on the vehicle level. And of course, to optimize on the vehicle level, also the motors have to be efficient and they have to be optimized and the optimization, uh, I, would, I, I just want to say is different than you would find a, in, a, in a Tesla because it's a different kind of technology and we are focusing more on different different parts of the efficiency map to provide you know lo a longer range uh, uh, operation for vehicles such as yours. That's a really good point, uh, Goraj, about the holistic approach because we started also with not making a steel uh, vehicle uh, a regular car into an electric car. We started with the drag, the lightweight, uh, with all these other things, and so uh, we would not get hung up on the particular efficiency of one component or, or another. It really is the whole system. And from a systems approach, we're three or four times better than just about everything else that's out there. So I think that's important takeaway. What people don't realize is in a traditional system where you have a motor and then transaxle and then drive lines that go out to the wheels, um, you take a loss through the gears. You take a loss through the universal joints. Um, it's terribly lossy after you get out of the electric motor. So you may have an electric motor that's 90% uh, efficient. Um, but uh, you're going to take another significant loss by the time you transmit that power to the wheel. Right. So if you could put that motor in the wheel and then transmit that power right away, uh, you get great efficiency out of the motor and you don't take the loss uh, from wearable components like gears and CV joints. Gears wear, it doesn't matter how efficient you make the gears, um, you know, they wear, they create heat. That's why they have to have oils Seals, very and all that stuff has to be worried about. But with our system, you know, you don't have to worry about anything except the axle bearings. That's, that's the only moving part, and those things last and last and last. Uh, next question. What keeps the vehicle from rolling downhill when parked in a slope? Is there a mechanism in the motor that prevents rotation when the motor is not energized? That is... One we have a, that right now. Yeah, we have an electronic parking brake uh, that initiates to keep you rolling down the hill. Obviously, you don't want to burn energy through the motor keeping the motor fixed. Um, it's a terribly lossy scenario when you basically hill hold an electric motor. So, um, so we don't do that. We use a mechanical device to, uh, to hold you on a hill. And then when you're ready to go, that releases. I think most EVs do that nowadays, but it's very seamless. Yeah, hard to, yeah. yeah. most EVs use some sort of uh, electric uh, brake assist. Um, is long time, two hours, high speed travel possible? Like two to five hours, 150 kilometers an hour? Or can the motor heat up? Uh, I would say there's no, uh, there's no issue at all with long distance and the motor heating. And there's a couple reasons for that. So your motor is designed to be very robust. 
I mean, it, I've seen it power all kinds of vehicles. Um, your motor on our vehicle vehicle is like going to a spa. You know, yeah. it's having the easiest day of its life. Uh, it's just there, it's getting massaged, just having tea. <laughs> uh, and so at steady state, even on an 8% grade, um, it's, it's, it's very few kilowatts that are being used. And then the, the waste heat, of course, is a very tiny proportion of that. Even in the testing that we've done here, um, we don't really have our cooling system on this particular vehicle fully connected, and it's just not an issue with the motors at all. So it, there's no worry about the motor and motor heating in terms of range or performance or anything at all. And you guys have done lots and lots with much bigger vehicles than ours that are generating much more heat than ours. Yeah, and I think it's uh, it provides you know again uh, uh, just an insight to room that you have to play uh, in your innovation. You said before about the the cooling system. You know you can turn down the cooling to save energy of the cooling pumps. You can really manage that temperatures in order to to get to where you want to be in terms of the, the vehicle level consumption. Because once you get to a vehicle like yours, uh, you know everything counts. Uh, right. And you're you're probably looking for you know every part and and uh, every every uh, bit of energy that you can save uh, because proportionally your vehicle is so efficient that everything you know <laughs> everything is uh, you can notice it basically in the end. It adds up. Yeah, at steady state we use such a little power that um, you know getting the waste heat out just by having air move uh, over the area of the motor uh, really gets a lot of heat out. It's probably more in track conditions where you're really pounding the motor and then you're stopping and there's no air flowing over the motor to, to get anything cool that is a more likely uh, you know, heating scenario. But, but I'm also interested to see, uh, Steve and Chris, uh, when you get to high speed efficiency testing you know, as a vehicle, because I mean, I, I also drive an EV and you really don't want to be traveling long distance at high speeds. I mean, you'll just stop all the time. Uh, so it will be interesting how, you know, the shape of your vehicle, um, how does it affect that high speed travel? Of course, the laws, the laws of physics are the laws of physics, but, but your coefficients are just lower. Yes. Uh, so basically, it will be interesting to see that. Yeah. The same, the same energy that it takes to push my 6,500 pound uh, electric vehicle that I drive on a daily basis would probably push us, uh, you know, well past the, uh, the speed limit. Um, you know, we're uh, we're talking just a couple horsepower to keep the Aptera going at steady state. So, yeah. you know, with uh, less aerodynamic vehicles, the equation gets a lot harder at higher speeds because the aerodynamic drag is so much more. So, you know, other vehicles traveling at 100 miles an hour just use a tremendous amount of energy uh, just pushing the air out of the way. So the Aptera won't have to fight that battle, uh, which is good for the motors and everything is powering it. Next question is uh, from someone who lives in Michigan. And they say a lot of salt is used on the roads in the winter. And believe me, salt gets <laughs> in everything. Uh, you mentioned water testing, but has that included salt water testing? And of course, we've already addressed cold testing with your video. Uh, yes, it, it did include. So uh, we had a salt mist test and a several tests of like that. Uh, so uh, you cannot uh, prevent it uh, penetrating inside, but there are additional barriers with uh, its specific functions uh, to cover these kind of uh, scenarios. Yeah, so, so there's a specific standard test actually, that's usually just done as a standalone test, which we do as a follow-up test to durability testing. And we take the motor after durability testing, we heat it up, and then we dip it in, in very cold, so negative degrees Celsius, cold, very salty water. Uh, so just a few, a few, few degrees uh, below zero. And, and you know, that difference in pressure, if there is any room for sucking in the water, it sucks in the water. And, that, and that's basically for us, the, the litmus test, whether uh, there has been any damage to the motor du du uh, during durability testing. Uh, and you know, as Gora said, salt will get, if, if it can get somewhere, it will get there and it will cause damage. So you really can see through this testing what you need to do uh, in design, yeah. Very good. Next question. Uh, could you show the torque curve for the selected motor? We don't have those curves published uh, on our website. Yeah, we're, we're, still, we're still doing a lot of testing. And as we said, um, Alafi is making 
um, a special production motor for us that's even more efficient than what they offer off the shelf. Um, and that, that work is ongoing and we'll, we'll get to a point where we can probably publish that, but I wouldn't expect it till closer to the end of this year. Uh, next question is, how does Aptera minimize the flexing of the three cables from each inverter to the motor on each wheel? Uh, I will tell you that uh, that is something that an engineer <laughs> is working on right now because uh, the vehicle that you see that everyone's seen does not have the beta production motors with the with the final design uh, land and cable entry angle. And so you're able to see the cables now in a way that in production you won't. And so uh, it is the, the motor, the orientation is being changed, I believe, in a way to minimize the twisting altogether of the cables. So it won't be like what you see here. Yeah, aerodynamics is, uh, is obviously of utmost importance. So getting those cables routed uh, into the proper aerodynamic foil arms so we can uh, you know, have the least amount of drag possible is the effort that we're going through now. But that has a lot to do with the the new motor design that we're working with Alafe yeah. on and how we route those cables out of the motor and then into That's a package cool. that uh, that gets it somewhere. Uh, protection. Are the motors, the motors are not protected by the suspension of the car. How do you protect it against vibrations? Okay, this is a great question for you guys. Uh, you, you've tested the motor and all these different uh, durability testing scenarios on gravel, on bumpy roads, on everything. Can you talk a little bit about the vibration on the motor that you've tested? Yeah, definitely. So you have to test, uh, I mean, first the, the loads are similar to the loads on hub bearings anyways. And there are um, scenarios and load cycles that you can apply. And then you can put uh, this random vibration accelerated tested for vibration. And then on top of that, you put uh, specific uh, shock tests, which was uh, 100 G in different orientations of motor. So you put it with the axle down or in radial direction and you do this kind of testing. Uh, and then some um, real real testing also on the vehicle. Maybe Goras, you can add something here. It's, it's a combination of design and then validation. Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. it, it, what, what people need to understand and I'm sure many of your, your viewers do, um, this is not the first electronic component that's been put into the wheel, right? So, uh, you know, companies are today developing electronic components for very interesting future use, but also in the past. Uh, so not just in wheel motors, but brake by wire components and similar things. But also in the past, you know, sensors uh, have been put in the wheel and also electronic parking brakes and so on. So uh, it, it's, it's not new what kind of loads are, uh, um, are applicable in terms of durability and especially fatigue in terms of materials. Uh, so if you if you just go and look at those standards and they are uh, they are very very clear in terms of where it comes from, and you can do the testing and you can find out what your component does. Uh, and that's basically a lot of people say, okay, what happens in that case? But it's definitely not the biggest challenge in developing an in-wheel motor. You know, there's so many simulation tools that give you very, very accurate results if you put it in the, in the hand of the right team. Uh, it, it's definitely not the hardest uh, thing to design. Um, uh, so in terms of, in terms of shocks, um, I would also say our motor is designed maybe differently to how some people imagine it. Actually, we design it in a way that the loads are not actually going through the motor. They are going through its bearing, but they're, they're basically leaving alone all of the motor parts. So the motor is just you know, suspended there Yes, it ca carries its own weight, but it does not carry the, the, the vehicle. So it just feels the vibrations, not the, not the, not the forces. Another question uh, from a viewer is, is there any risk of damage from monster potholes? <laughs> Short answer is yes. Uh, I mean, if you damage your wheel, uh, then uh, the first thing is, you know, borderline, when you damage your wheel, you won't damage your motor. Right. But if you go, I mean, we don't have potholes like this in Europe, at least not, not uh, uh, the roads I, I have driven, but I've been in Michigan enough times to know that there are holes in, in the US which are monster potholes. Uh, and I do imagine there will be at a certain point in time a pothole which will, which will also damage our motor. Uh, that, but, that's uh, amazing, actually. There are, there are places, even with cold weather, uh, that somehow magically are able to maintain their roads without potholes. <laughs> uh, I don't know what the answer to that is, but uh, 
We uh, we have an uh, amazingly lightweight uh, wheel that we couple with a La Faze motor, and the wheel is usually what takes the brunt of pothole abuse. So kind of your first layer of protection, you know, you've got your pneumatic tire, then you've got your wheel that's going to crumple, and then you come with the uh, impact with the, uh, with the Alafe motor. But, um, you know, you saw from some of their videos, the drop test and other durability right. stuff they've done. So, um, you know, an 1,800-pound vehicle is going to take a pothole a lot differently than a 6,500-pound vehicle. So I, I would expect that we're, uh, we're going to fare very well in those aggressive type yeah. of scenarios. And even in those scenarios, you would never have the same G-force imparted onto the motor through the tire and then the wheel versus the drop test that you've done. So I would I can't imagine that ever happening really. But who knows? Yeah, it's interesting. You know that drop test was actually done to ensure that there is no hidden damage if there is some mishandling in the assembly of the motor. So the, the test that you are referring to is a shock test. You know the 100 G. That's you know. Uh, just uh, exaggerating, you know, the possible real case uh, situation. Oh, well, that's great to know. Um, let's see. Can you show the actual motor and point out aspects of it? Okay, so I'm going to go point out uh, some of the aspects of your motor right over here. So we have to have uh -huh. one right here. So you can see this is the uh, the rear wheel. This vehicle has all wheel drive. And, um, Phase wires coming out. We've got the coolant lines blocked off because we've got it filled with coolant. Uh, we're not doing that on the front wheels, but um, the back wheels we are. And it's just held on with four bolts. Yeah, the interesting thing about the configuration of the inwell motor is that all the forces to the motor actually come through the axle bearing that is on the four bolts on the on the swing arm or the upright. So the actual motor. So you see the green part in the videos isn't taking any load. All the loads are transmitted through the axle bearing there. Yeah, the, the, the only thing basically that uh, we need to take care of, you know, electric motors, they have gaps. They have gaps between the static part and the rotating part. And that's basically where the magnetic field is generating the torque. Uh, what we need to ensure through testing is that this gap does not close. Uh, and, you know, as simple as it sounds, it, it, it is something that is a challenge, but it, at least it's, it's a very, very, you know, um, uh, um, tangible challenge that you can solve through engineering. Very good. Our next question. Uh, what determines the top speed achievable by the motor? This is a question for you, Goraj. Uh, yeah, so on one side, uh, you, know, you can uh, dimension the motor and uh, optimize it for any, more or less any speed you want, you know, so you can go high voltage and low number of serial connections inside the motor uh, of how you connect the phases and you can reach very high speed. But that means that if you want to at the same time have a motor that uh, gives a lot of torque, you will also have to have high current. And then you want to actually optimize the whole system of the inverter plus the motor in such a way that you get both high speed, the speed that you need, and the torque that you need. Uh, so there are, you know, either compromises or you, you optimize it for, for that uh, specific purpose. Uh, the thing here is that uh, it's a direct drive, so no gears, and especially no switching gears, you know, uh, first gear, second gear, and so on. So uh, with the fixed gear ratio, you always have these, uh, these ratios that, uh, you know, you have to do, do both the torque and the speed or the voltage and the current. Somebody had a question on the uh, cooling fluids that we're using for the motor in this instance. instance and uh, Steve's been working on the uh, fluid cooling systems. Yeah, it, at present, the coolant is just a glycol solution, uh, like any common coolant. Uh, we're not using a dielectric oil or anything like that. Uh, another question um, is, is there any kind of preventative maintenance or ongoing maintenance or, or maintenance intervals that these motors need to see over time? Um, Alafe, maybe your comments on what the su suggestions are for this, uh, uh, the lifetime of these motors. Yeah, I think it uh, slightly varies among different uh, motors that we have, but I think uh, the target is 30,000 kilometers, so like a bit less than 20,000 miles for replacing the seals. But Goras, please correct me if, I, if I'm wrong. It's, it's double that. It's, uh, it's double that amount. That is the, the replacement. 
Uh, however, right now we are, you know, we are trying to be on the safe side. In the future, we are, so at least conceptually, we, we are going in the direction of not needing to replace the seals. Um, so basically to have a maintenance less motor. Today we are not there yet, so we would not recommend driving uh, for too long without replacing the seals. Yeah, one of the great things about having such an efficient or a platform focused on efficiency is that uh, driving for efficiency also helps things like the seals. An inefficient seal is one that's creating heat and is breaking down over time. So we don't want that in our production motor. We want something that creates no heat and has no drag, uh, but still keeps the motor safe. So, you know, our, our perfect seal is one that doesn't have any friction and thus would last a lifetime. Um, so it's like in the physics books and university, they, I always say, assume this object has no friction and no mass. <laughs> where, where can I get that object? That's what we need. Um, our, let's see, our hub motors three times the cost, i.e. per wheel, means three extra motors, three extra inverters, or does the benefit of hub motors outweigh any added cost? So maybe we could all speak to this. I'll just, I'll give my opinion and say on a holistic basis, I think we're to net less for an all-wheel drive vehicle because remember, we don't have a gearbox, we don't have uh, drive shafts, we don't have CV joints. And even in low volume, uh, those items, you can't just buy them off the shelf. You have to go to these manufacturers and pay their tooling and NRE costs and they have to make one for you. Uh, so I would say on a net basis, uh, it's probably comparable. I think with higher volume, it could be even less, uh, especially when you're considering the benefits of an all wheel drive vehicle. For just two-wheel drive, um, front-wheel drive, I think it's, I think it's probably more cost-efficient. But that's my opinion, just from the numbers I've seen and thinking about the production aspect. But maybe well, you guys have a different. More important for us is not having to carry the weight of the extra motor components, transaxle drive shafts. Um, you know, the Aptera is going to be very sensitive to weight. Uh, every 30 pounds that you add is going to lose you roughly a percent of, of range. So, uh, you know, our weight equation is such that keeping things uh, lightweight is, is the most important. Um, also being able to run, you know, each motor at its highest efficiency uh, in its torque band is, uh, you know, just an amazingly capable. If you throw two wheels to one transaxle, uh, there's really no tunability in that efficiency band because you're, you're always driving two wheels uh, type thing. So um, I think the tunability of having separate motors, separate inverters, um, you know, just pays huge dividends for our efficiency uh, versus just being purely focused on a cost constraint. You know, in the, in the ice engine world, internal combust combustion engines, you buy a, uh, a 350 small block with the transmission in a production environment for like 800 bucks. So, um, you know, obviously EVs are a lot higher tech and you're trading some of that for, you know, something that's going to last a lifetime and be able to propel your vehicle without any pump lubricants or friction or all that stuff. So it's a, it's a big equation to, to balance those uh, when you talk about single motor, transaxle, gears, drive shaft versus in-wheel motors versus anything else out there. Yeah, definitely. You know, so the in in small volume manufacturing, these are some additional benefits that you get with a system that can be, you know, in a similar way used in different vehicles. However, uh, even in uh, high volume manufacturing, of course, if you look on just on the bill of material for the propulsion, then on the components level, it will be more costly than the EXL solution, for example, because obviously you have two motors, two inverters. And this is more costly than one motor, one inverter plus the uh, reduction gear. Uh, however, this difference is not that huge. So our estimates are that uh, it's around 20%. But then on the vehicle level, you can gain additional benefits to actually make a vehicle more cost effective. Another question was, how can we use these motors most effectively with torque vectoring and stability control to pass some of the standard FMVSS or um, you know, a NHTSA highway test like the J-turn, the moose test, um, you know, stuff that you may have seen on, uh, on the internet of different vehicles doing, you know, really aggressive turning, stopping, but. Uh, and the other garage was in Sweden recently. I'm sure you're probably familiar with the moose test there. <laughs> <laughs> we actually didn't find any, uh, any, I don't know what's the plural of, of moose, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> moose, moose, I guess, yeah. 
Yeah, I didn't. Find, we didn't find any of those, uh, but we did encounter uh, a deer on the road. Uh, but we were driving a Volvo with spike, spiky, uh, spiky threads, so it doesn't count. Uh, it was on <laughs> public road. Um, but joking aside, uh, we do we do de develop uh, advanced algorithms, so we're not currently yet production ready for those. But we are able to demonstrate benefits in such tests. So, for example, much higher um, uh, uh, exit speeds from these uh, maneuvers than than without this kind of control. And it's basically ESP 2.0. So you're not just using your brakes to to generate the the yaw that you want in in uh, in turning, but you are using also traction. So you have uh, you know this extra gradient that you have between the the wheels that really helps you. That's one part of it. And the second part of it, you know, brakes are hydraulic, uh, which is really good, reliable and so on, but it's not as fast as, as electric control. So you can do things faster and you can derive, you know, really interesting things out of that. Very it good. brings up a great point with the regen of these motors because they're bigger than a typical electric motor. The leverage that you have for regenerative braking is that much greater. So you can use it to, to much better effect in stability control because, you know, uh, if you're familiar with EVs, you know, one pedal driving, you let off the gas pedal and, it, and the, the motor regens to bring you to a stop versus letting off the gas pedal and then pushing a hydraulic brake pedal uh, to stop you. But that also um, relates to the stability control in that the three different motors can effectively brake themselves to get your vehicle into the position that you want it to be, which... Uh, is great for snow and ice and moose tests and whatever else you want to throw at the Aptera. Yeah, split split mu testing, for example, is really interesting when you have side by side comparison vehicle with or without, uh, uh, you know, independent wheel drive. You know, one is just it uses brakes, so you can see how the brakes are working tirelessly to to bring it up the hill on split mu, whereas you know a new wheel vehicle just it just goes. So it's really such a contrast uh, in those kind of, you know, again, fringe scenarios. Well, how will we do a split mu on a three-wheeler? <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to front invent a new procedure, you know, so it's a... Uh... Front and back, front and back. The, the torque vectoring also can relate to uh, steering situations, like when you're in a parking lot and things like that. Um, you know, we, we will have electric assist um, uh, through our, our steering to give you power steering but also the electric motors can, uh, can help in that as well. Uh, it can, the motors can kind of pull you into a parking spot because you can speed up the outside motor and slow down the inside yeah. motor type. And stuff. those are algorithms that would still have to be developed. Uh, so we, and we talked about that when we were in Slovenia, but uh, we to answer the question, we, do, we are planning on having the electric power steering uh, specifically for ADAS and we'd be able to achieve that. And torque vectoring is something that's an ongoing. ongoing so it just adds a little nicety. Um, same thing with, with, uh, with wheel control like that too. You can do fun things uh, like lane keep in a regular vehicle. Um, you know, the power assist in your steering rack or your steering column turns the wheel for you to keep you centered in the lane. But if you have crisp wheel control and uh, torque vectoring, you can, without moving the steering wheel, speed up a wheel, slow down a wheel, and you can keep yourself in the lane without having to turn the physical wheel. So, um, you know, there's a, there's a world of fun we're going to have over the next nine months uh, working on those algorithms with Alafe and that sort of stuff. But the, the possibilities are limitless. What you've probably seen most of is like the tank turns, uh, you know, spinning the vehicle around on a dime. Um, that's the easy stuff. The, the harder stuff is, you know, what we're talking but about. Having crisp digital control of every wheel, basically the possibilities are limited to the algorithms. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the tank turn you saw before on one of the videos, uh, I think it was just an idea of an engineer one evening and the next morning this, this, this video was taken. <laughs> so, you know, it's, some things are really simple. Of course, you, you don't want to put that software on the road, but, you know, functionally to do it, yeah, quite easy. Uh, one of the questions are, are we using uh, silicon carbide or gallium nitride in our inverters? Uh, say not yet, but... Uh, in I know we've, we've talked about some of the, the new efficient semiconductors that are out there, and uh, I, I don't think we talk, we're not talking publicly about what that roadmap is, but is there anything you guys want to share on that? Uh, it is, yeah, go, go ahead. Maybe you can. Uh, sure. So, I mean, definitely silicon carbide is a trend. Uh, the first one we did was uh, in 2014, 
uh, with uh, Fraunhofer ISB and some other partners. Uh, I think we used Fairchild chips for that. Uh, it was actually a, a near wheel motor that we did with on board on the motor uh, inverter based on silica carbide technology. So we went to higher PWM frequencies and demonstrated that it's feasible and that it uh, you know you can get a nicer current uh, shape. So you reduce the current ripple and by this you improve the efficiency. Um, however, you know we have to use technologies that are available. And that we we don't want to you know invent in all the areas because uh, you know simply uh, we we are focused on on the motors and the power electronics control algorithms and uh, vehicle control unit uh, hardware and software so it's a lot of uh, challenges and uh, then we take you know the hardware of the power electronics that's already already available um, and you know from that perspective it's obviously also the choice of a vehicle maker of what they uh, favorize as the most important uh, characteristics and then the development can can target uh, that uh, specific uh, technologies uh, so the knowledge is here and uh, it can be done it just has to be you know placed in a suitable time otherwise you can always just constantly innovate innovate something new but you don't get anything to the market. So, you know, we have to select uh, technologies that, you know, we can put on the road in a reasonable time. It's an exciting time to be an EV with so many new technologies coming out. Uh, last question is we, uh, will the owners of Eptera have any influence in these torque vectoring algorithms and how to set their own tasks? Um, you know, kind of user selectability, uh, stability control, probably not in any safety critical um, aspects, uh, but yeah, I could certainly see uh, fun things like putting it in donut mode uh, so you can impress your friends or um, annoy your neighbors. Or annoy your neighbors. <laughs> uh, but yeah, there's, there's lots of fun things that, uh, that can be done uh, with that that may be kind of parlor tricks. Uh, but in general, our aspiration is to just make the vehicle as stable and safe as possible and comfortable to drive and spirited. I want to thank you guys. Uh, as, as we wrap up here, are there any thoughts on the future? What will it hold for Alafe or the EV industry? Uh, so the, the question for me? Yeah, for uh, yeah, just uh, talking about the future, if you guys have any closing comments on, uh, on how Eptera and Alafe are going to make the world a better place. Well, I think it's fantastic to have a vehicle that's really, you know, bringing something new, something fresh, uh, user friendly, um, because, um, you know, all the other vehicles are out there as far as the design is concerned for, for quite some time already. And uh, I think Aptera is really exciting. So um, it's, uh, I think, currently the only vehicle that we have actually also pre-ordered. So we are very motivated for this to, to get on the road uh, soon. Uh, just today, I was also talking to some certification authorities in Europe, you know, how to do all the homologation challenges here. Yes. So we would really like to, to make this happen. And uh, I think by this, you know, we will open a lot of uh, other opportunities for, for people to innovate and, and to use something that's environmentally friendly and it's, it's a step forward. So uh, we were happy to be part of that. And uh, yeah, now it's really a good time uh, for these technologies. De definitely, I want to just add that uh, Aptera is do doing, you know, sort of what many engineers think is the right thing to do. You know, if you want to build an EV, that's how you want to build it. Uh, and I think from that perspective, we are really happy to be a part of it. And we are seeing, uh, I have just an example. Yesterday, I got a, like a congratulation to be a part of this project by a person that tried to build uh, a wooden electric car uh, in Hungary, I don't know, was it 10 years ago, Goras, do you remember? Uh, uh, and, and, if a and bit more. They, yeah, they had great vision. They were just before, before their time and they had, you know, very, uh, very similar holistic, uh, holistic approach, sustainability and so on. So, uh, you know, just to, to see you uh, not give up on the idea, which was originally already great. Uh, but then uh, find it within this new time. So I just saw a, a, an article about you. It said it, it was talking about 100 miles. So basically, 10 years later, you just multiply the miles by 10, and you, you're right. doing it. <laughs> so that's you know, it's really impressive, and, and really glad to be a part of it. We're uh, we're humbled to have your guys' support, and um, 
you know, it's amazing that our our, our two companies have uh, have evolved over the years and now are coming together to really make something uh, truly great. So thank you for your guys' time and support. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you all for joining us. Thank your team for helping set this up there in Slovenia. And uh, we're going to have more of these uh, tech talks coming up in the future. Let us know what your, your thoughts about this one and uh, what you'd like to hear about next time. Thanks so much. Thank you. Good. Thank you, everyone. Bye.